Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses number 102 and 103, which read as follows. Yoja gata satang bhase anatta padda sanghita ekang dhamma padang se yo yang sutva upasammati yo sahasang sahasena Sangame manuse jine e kancha jayamatanang sabve sangama juttamo. Which means the first one is actually similar, almost the same as the ones we've looked at uh, in the past couple of sessions. Uh, whoever should speak. Uh, a hundred gata satang, a hundred gatas, a hundred verses that are not are connected with the path of uh, connected with a useless path, so that, that lead you in the wrong, mislead you, or are useless basically. Ekang dhamma padang seyo. One word of dhamma is greater. Yang Sutva Upasamati, having heard which, one attains peace. So this very very much the same as the past two verses. But 103 is different. Who should, and this is a, a well-quoted verse, who should conquer thousands of thousands, a thousand thousand, no? a thousand times a thousand, sahasang sahasena, Sangha me manuse jine, in war a thousand men conquer. Who should a, th who should a thousand thousand, it's a million, uh, men conquer in war? So if you conquer a million men in war. E kancha jaya matanang, the one victory, which is the victory over oneself. Uh, that over oneself is 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 better. Satwe, sa, uh, the victory over oneself, satwe, sangha majutamo. That is the highest conquering in battle. The conquering of oneself. So, who should conquer? If one should conquer a million people, a million enemies in battle, it's still better to conquer oneself. This is the best. Conquering in war. So, this these two verses we are told um, were recited in regards to Kundala Kesi. Kundala Kesi, Kesi is Kesa is hair, so Kesi is one who has hair. Kundala is a spiral. And so the story goes that uh, there was a girl of sixteen years old who um, was the daughter of a rich merchant in Rajagaha. And now at the time there seemed to be, there was apparently a practice whereby women were kept in seclusion or kept locked up because uh, there was a belief that I think even the commentary espouses that "Quote unquote, when women reach this age, they burn and long for men. So there was the idea that she would probably be rather uh, pr promiscuous. Um, I mean, it's actually quite fair. It's just that it doesn't apply equally to it doesn't apply um, pr uh, only to women. The same thing happens to men at that age. So to be fair, they should be locking all the men men up. But you know, society at that time being what it was." They lock the women up. Well, really to keep them safe, not just because they didn't trust them, but because uh, to protect them and to ensure that they married someone who was suitable rather than just going with whoever. So they kept her on, on the seventh floor of their house. They had a kind of a palatial residence with seven floors. Uh, maybe it just had many floors, but on the top floor. And one day there was a parade, um, which apparently was another custom, where they would parade uh, criminals through the city. And so they had caught this rather 
a vicious criminal and were parading him through the uh, through the the town taking him to the place of execution it's a way of kind of um, boasting that they had caught bragging about it and and uh, sort of um promoting the, the, the system of government. Yes, yes, look, we've caught this guy. Look how great we are. And then they would take them and cut their heads off. So they were taking this guy through the streets and whipping him and you know, people throwing rotten vegetables at him and all. And then they passed by this house where this woman, this girl is bored to tears up on the top floor of her house. And she looks down and she sees this man being dragged through the streets and immediately she falls in love with him. If if we were of that sort of bent, we might say that this, she had met her, her soulmate. This man was her soulmate. Um, of course, in Buddhism we don't have such beliefs, and with good reason, as this story actually well illustrates. But to her, this man was was the man for her. This was she'd never seen someone, never had someone have this effect on her, and uh, we all. I think without proper instruction tend to get, get this sort of idea where, wow, it must mean something. I fall in, lo in love with this person. It must mean that they are the one for me. And we have all these songs to back that sort of idea up. We, we even apply it to food and so on. We think that it means something that I prefer this food. I prefer salty food. I prefer spicy food. And somehow, therefore, that's what I should eat. When in fact, that could be the very food that kills you in the end. Uh, and the same goes with many different things. So our partiality, our preference for or against something, is often a very poor indicator of the the the, the benefit, benefits of it or the beneficence of the object of our desires. Nonetheless, she became instantly uh, obsessed with this man, and so she told her servants to call her parents and said. And they came and she said, I must have that man as my husband. And they said, what? What are you talking about? How, how, how could we possibly... Are you, in, are you crazy? What do you, what do you want with, a, with a, such a person like that? Don't talk nonsense. And she said, if I don't get him as my husband, I'll stop eating. I will, I will die here. I, will, I, will, um, I, will, I won't be able to live. It won't be possible for me to continue living if I don't get him as my husband. Only if I can have him as my soulmate will I be able to live. And so she refused to eat and uh, she just claimed that no matter what she was going to starve herself. So they, um, well first the mother, so first, sorry, first the mother came and she said this to the mother and then the mother couldn't convince her. She said, we'll, we'll give you anyone you can have find a suitable husband for you, someone who is worthy of you, not this terrible, vicious thief. But she wouldn't have it, so she called, the mother called the father, the father came and tried to bully her into it and convince her into it and convince her to let go of this man, and she wouldn't have any of it, which just goes to show you how pernicious clinging can be. And so finally, they, at their wit's end, they called to the, some king's officer and gave him a thousand gold coins and said, we must have that man. And so the man, uh, the, this king's man, uh, took the money and uh, replaced, switched this, this thief, this terrible villain with uh, some innocent person and had that innocent person e executed and then sent the, the thief off to the rich man and then sent word on to the king that the villain had been executed. And so this woman was ecstatic, this 16-year-old girl, really. And so she married this man and strove to really please him. Like she said, I, I, I've rescued you so that you can be my husband, and now I will serve you as your faithful wife. And she tried her best to please him and do everything for him. She cooked for him, she cleaned for him. As she did everything. She was like the model sort of, well, I guess you could say the slave wife, you know, servant um, of sorts, uh, out of her, her dedication and devotion and her sincere belief that this guy was, was meant for her and there was something to that, that love. 
because she had been always taught that sort of thing. We are, I think young women in, in traditional societies were often taught that, well, you know, someday my prince will come and all that. So this is where she was headed. It was how she had been taught. And um, you know, it's funny how women are portrayed, just as a little aside here, in, in the Buddhist text, women are often portrayed a little bit um, with a little bit of sexism. You, you can't deny it. Like the, that quote that I gave you, that's typical of the commentaries, to talk about how, how insati insatiable women are. But it's not exactly sexism. It's, it's because this is the kind of thing that you have to remind monks of, male monks, because that would have been the main audience for these texts. For the most part, they would be men who were... Um, you know, of a bent to want to to uh, incline towards attraction towards women, you know, thinking this sort of thing, and so you have this um, constant reminder. Well, not constant, but this. Uh, every so often, you'll come across a passage like this that just says women are. You can't trust them. They'll cheat on you. They'll. Uh, they're insatiable, and they'll always want to have more children, and so on and so on. Talking about how. If you read these out of context, or if you just read them at face value, then uh, they really sort of paint women in a bad light. But as to women themselves, that we're going to see in this story, uh, women are given, I think, a fairly fair treatment in 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 the Dhamma, in the Buddha's teaching. That uh, especially in the in, in a society where they really weren't given, as you can see much of a fair treatment, they're being locked up and all that, and having to wait on their husbands and so on. Um, so anyway, we'll see how this develops, but at the time this is what she thought was the right thing to do. And so the story starts to sound like this is the moral of the story, which it's not, but it sounds to this point that well, this is the thing. She got her husband, uh, and now, now her duty for her life is to uh, to devote herself to her, to him. And so, really, the, you would think that the average thief who was just about to be executed would be overjoyed with this, but when, what was going through the thief's mind? The only thing he could think of, it says, is, when can I kill this woman, steal her jewels, and go back to living a, a free life? where I can eat in any, in any tavern or restaurant that I want and where I can make money uh, however I want, usually by killing and raping and murdering people. and No, killing and raping and, and pillaging and so on, and robbing people. So indeed, that's what he schemed to do. So uh, for a few days he, he was thinking about how he could take advantage of the situation until finally he came across a plan. He, he, he figured he saw what was going to work. And so he lay down in bed and, and wouldn't get up. And she said, husband, what's wrong? And he said, I feel, I feel really sick, really bad. And she said, why? Well, I see the thing is, and he, and he starts to spin his yarn. The thing is, the reason I'm free, I mean, thank you for freeing me, but the really the reason why I'm free is I made a vow to uh, the spirit on the top of, of one, of the, one of the mountains that if I got free, I would give some offering to the, the angel, to the deity. And that's who sent me you. You were sent by this, this angel. That's why you, I caught your eye that day. And that's why now you're my wife. And he said, I just feel really bad because I made that promise and I haven't fulfilled it. And he said, well, then let's go fulfill it. And he said, oh, really? You'd be willing to do that? And she said, oh, yes, absolutely. And he said, what do we need? Well, we sh he said, well, we should take some rice porridge with honey and the five, five kinds of flowers, whatever five kinds those are. And she agreed. And so they went up to the top of the, 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 the place that's called Robber's Peak. Apparently there's a place called Robber's Peak, which is where they would, in the past maybe, they would, they would throw people over the cliff. So it was a, you could go up one side and, and then there would be a cliff face and they would take robber, take villains up and they would throw them over the cliff and they would fall down to their death. 
So he took her up there and uh, told her to, he said, bring all your jewels, leave all your servants behind, but bring all your finery, all your, all your, your valuables. No, well, he didn't say it like that. But he said, put on all your finest jewels and, and clothes and so on and come with me and we'll go together. And so they went up and they, they even told the servants not to follow them. And when they got to the top of the, of the cliff, he, uh, he just stood there. And she said, okay, so what are we going to do? And he said, how are we going to do this offering? And he said, uh, I don't really, I don't care about any offering. That was really just a lie. I'm here to steal your jewels and kill you. So, sorry. And it was just like a defining moment in this woman's life. Like, can you imagine having really your whole uh, world? Every, this man was her, her world. Not for very long, but it had just it, something that she had been preparing herself to dedicate her life to. And to suddenly have it pulled out from underneath her. And, and moreover, her whole outlook on life to have it just shattered. This was my soulmate. What? This is a joke? And it wasn't a joke. And he said, no, I'm, you know, I'm ready to, ready to kill you. There's nothing, no, re no need to, to be, a f to, to cry, you know, this is it. Just, uh, I'll take your jewels now and, and then throw you over the edge. That's all there, that's all that's left now. And so she she said to him, "Look, take my jewels. You don't, you know. There's no need to kill me. I've I've been kind to you. I promise I won't tell anyone." And he said, "I can't trust you. If I let you go, you'll turn me in, and they'll come looking for me, and they'll execute me for real this time. Uh, if I'm going to do this, I have to kill you. So sorry, but them's the breaks." And so suddenly her mind cleared up with this. She was she's freed from her stupor and she just just mentally hit herself over the head, uh, shaking her head at herself how, how how gullible she had been, how how misled she had been, how intoxicated she had been. But her wisdom came back. And she said, she said to herself, ah, this wisdom is not, not just for cooking and cleaning. And so she thought of a plan and she said to him, okay, husband, uh, if that's your wish, then as your wife, uh, all I ask is that you allow me to pay obeisance, ob obeisance to you, to pay respect to you, you know, and to bow down to you. And he said, fine, fine, whatever you must. Last, last request and then you're gone. And so she <laughs> held her hands up in supplication and went around him three times and then embraced him from the front and then embraced him from behind. And when she got behind him, she grabbed him, she, she held, grabbed him in the back of his head and the, and the lower back and pushed him over the edge and he fell to his death. And so this woman, now fully fully awakened in a mundane sense to her folly, suddenly took stock of, of her situation and her life and realized that, uh, well, basically her whole life had been, her whole outlook on life had been a sham, had been uh, a lie the whole idea of true love, love at first sight, etc., uh, etc., et was just a lie. And so, and and furthermore, she had just killed her husband, <laughs> and that wasn't likely to go over well if she went back home. So instead, she threw her threw her valuables away, and went and found some rags and decided to go forth. And she became a wanderer. As a wanderer, she wandered through India and t until she came to uh, a group of ascetics, female ascetics, and she asked to join them. And I guess there were female ascetics at that time, or maybe they were male ascetics. And 
asked them if she could join them, and this is, I think, where uh, they, they actually pulled her hair out, because that was a thing in India. They would put boards, put two, um, two boards on their shoulder, they would dig, sorry, dig, they had a big pit, and they'd put you in the pit and put boards on your shoulders, and then they'd stand on those, those, those boards, and then they'd take a special comb, and they'd actually pull your hair out by the roots. And that's how they would uh, ordain you. And I think that's how she got the name Kundala Kesi. So her hair was, her hair ended up being stunted by that, or turned in, it became curly. Or maybe she just had curly hair. I don't know. Anyway, she went forth, and they taught her one thousand um, views or beliefs, one thousand articles of faith. So these were one thousand. Um, teachings in this other religion. We don't know what those 1,000 things were, but these were the 1,000 things. And she became so skilled in them that she was able to use them and able to really befuddle any of her, any uh, person she debated with, any of anyone who, who thought to question her. So she became quite an a, a exceptional um, debater or religious leader, preacher, uh, and and finally, and so finally they said to her, well, you know, now you're, you can be a real teacher of our religion, and so they sent her out into the world, into, into India, and they gave her a branch of a, a rose apple tree, which was the tree of India, and they said, take this branch and put it down, uh, and cha and use this branch to ch to challenge other ascetics and convert them to our doctrine. And they said, if you find someone, if someone is able, if you have a lay, if they're a lay person, is able to uh, defeat you in debate, then then you have to disrobe and become their servant. If a monk is able to uh, ch defeat you in debate, then you have to become their student. That's your, your task now. That's what, what you have to look for. Find someone who is better than you. And so she went throughout India and she was so skilled in debate that no one could defeat her on any one of the 1,000 points. And so eventually she got a real reputation and all the other ascetics were afraid to challenge her. Everyone was afraid to challenge her. And so she eventually got a little bit uh, well, anyway, she she went wandering far and wide, and eventually she came to Sawati, hmm, which uh, would present a, a little bit more of a challenge to her. And so she went for alms in Sawati, but before she went into the city, she took her, her rose apple branch, and she would change it. You know, it had leaves on it, so it was a, a fresh branch, and she would cut down a new one when, it, when the old one withered out, but it was somehow a, a, a symbol and so she would, she stuck it in a pile of sand, or, or stuck it in the in the earth, and uh, would leave it there. And she told the she told these boys. She said, "Look, if if anyone um, wants to challenge me, tell them that they should what they should do is trample that, um, or people just knew maybe that they should trample this branch if they wanted to challenge her." And so she went for alms and left this branch there, and everyone was afraid to go near it. And these boys sort of gathered around it to see who would dare to challenge the famous, uh, what they called her, the ascetic of the rose apple. And some, for some reason she was carrying this branch around, and it was her, her symbol by which people would know that she had come and she was ready to challenge anyone. And that morning... Who should happen along but the well-known monk, who was it, Sariputta. On that morning, Sariputta came by and saw the rose apple branch and asked the boys, well, what does this mean? Where, where does this come from? And the boys told, told him the story that this was from, Kunda, from the rose apple ascetic. She had come to challenge other ascetics to a debate and whoever would like to debate her should trample this and he said to the boys well then trample it you know, pull it up and step on it 
step all over it. And they said, uh, we're afraid to, Venerable Sir. I said, oh, don't, don't, don't be afraid, I'll answer her questions. Just go ahead. And then he went and he sat down under a tree nearby. And sure enough, the boys trampled on this uh, branch. And they stood there jumping on it and stomping on it. And Kund uh, sorry, the, the, the ascetic came out and she saw this and she scolded them and she said, I'm, what, what's the meaning of this? Come on, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to debate with you little boys. And they said, he told me to do it. And they pointed to the elder, Sariputta. And she turned and she said, is that true? And he said, yes. And he said, well, then will you debate with me? And she he said, sure. And so, she, and so he said, come by my residence and we'll debate. And so she went, she got ready, um, I guess went and prepared herself. And meanwhile, these little, these boys or whoever was around spread word. And all the people of the city spread the word and said, Sariputta is going to debate with the ascetic of the rose apple tree. And oh, this would be something to see. And so they, everyone was excited. And so they all came along, followed after uh, this the rose apple ascetic to, to Sariputta's residence. And they sat outside of his kuti. And everyone sat down and listened. And the woman said, the, the ascetic said to Sariputta, I'd like to ask you a question. And he said, well, then ask. And she asked him all, she asked some questions about each of the 1,000 uh, beliefs. And he was able to refute each and every one of them that no one had ever been able to refute even one of until she was out. And, she, and he said, uh, I, said uh, I said to her, so you've only asked these few questions, do you have any more? <laughs> After she asked a thousand, right? And he said, and she said, no, that's all. Realizing that she had now finally been bested, and he said, okay, well then I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, will you answer me? And she said, yes, for sure. And he said, what is one? Now this this may not have quite the significance. I think it actually sounds more profound than it actually is. But the truth of this question is it's it's the first question that you're supposed to ask of a novice monk, meaning it's the first thing that a novice Buddhist learns. And don't don't worry if you've never heard of these questions there. They're not so much used as far as I've seen, although this was the tradition. These are the ten there's ten questions that a novice should learn. And the first, so it's what is one, what are two, what are three, what are four, or what is four, what is five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and it's just one to ten. So he asked, Eka Namaking, what is one? And she couldn't figure out, she couldn't answer even this one simple question. It was too simple. It was too, uh, too ambiguous, really. Like, what could one be? Uh, do you say it's this or do you say it's that? You can always be attacked no matter which way you answer that. And she said, I can't answer it. And he, she said, please tell me, please tell me the answer. And he said, well, if you ordain under me, then, or if you ordain in our religion, you, then we can give you the answer for sure. And they said, she said, immediately, well, then ordain me. And so he sent her to the bhikkhunis, and the bhikkhunis ordained her, and she became known as Kundalakesi. This is the story of Kundalakesi. Within a few days, or a few weeks, or a very short time, she became an arahant, and she had all sorts of magical powers and supernatural faculties, and was, of course, free from suffering. And she became, I think, one of the great disciples of the Buddha. doesn't mention it here, but she is one of the well-known She's well known for her wisdom. She's well known for her quick thinking, for her, but uh, mostly known for the story, well, for having killed her husband, which is, of course, not the best 
thing to be known for or to have been such a fool. But for waking up and for quickly adapting to the new information, once she saw how foolish she had been, she was quickly able to adapt herself. And uh, that's admirable. You know, I mean, doing evil deeds is often just because of wrong view, because you've been taught the wrong things. But some people, once they realize the truth and realize the error of their ways, they don't change. They're unable to change. They're not strong enough. And so it's admirable that she was able to change, and so profoundly change that she actually became an arahant. And so the monks were talking about this. They're talking talking about two things that were that were pretty impressive. First of all, the first impressive thing was the fact that all it took was one question, right? And so this is relates to the first verse. So they were talking about how how incredible it was that with just such a short teaching she was able to realize the truth. And then the second thing is that uh, Actually, not quite so impressive, but it seemed to be an impressive thing. And the monks were talking about how 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 shrewd she was, how how clever she was at being able to outwit her husband and defeat him. You know, he was ready to kill her. She ended up killing him. And it's amazing that she was able to think so quickly and and defeat him. And so, of course, the Buddha came in and asked them what they were talking about. When he found out what they were talking about, he, when they found out what he was talking about, they said, uh, well, he, he pointed out both, as he, in regards to both things, first he said, well, uh, it's not a matter of quantity, it's a matter of quality. And we've, of course, dealt with this before. But then he talks about the second verse, which is a new theme. And he said, well, you know, defeating her husband wasn't really that impressive, De defeating oneself, conquering oneself—that's impressive. And so this is a this this verse is actually quite important, and it's something that we always remind ourselves of whenever we want to get in fights or win arguments or when we feel good about ourselves because we're successful, because we're competitive, or because we are able to defeat others in army, in 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 conflict, or in in debate, or in war, or anything. And so this is contrary to the Buddha's teaching, that this kind of defeating other people is actually quite uh, meaningless. It doesn't have any real benefit. It's conquering ourselves. This is the greatest conquer, greatest conquest, is the teaching. And so that's the Dhammapada verse that we have, verses 102 and 103. How it relates to our practice, talking just about the second verse, uh, it's really a good way to describe what we're talking about in when we talk about meditation, self-conquest, working to better oneself, working to overcome the enemies inside. He's, he talks about the, the villains, so they're talking about, oh, uh, she conquered this villain, and the Buddha comes in and says, he actually says, it's the villains in the heart. It's the evil ones in the heart. These enemies that are inside of us. This is the real conquest that is praiseworthy, that you should uh, praise. You know, the fact that she was able to become an arahant and give up all of her uh, defilements. And so it's a difference between what we esteem in the world. Most people will esteem you by the accomplishments you've made, because that's all we can see. That's what we normally, what we are accustomed to. Uh, we don't realize the profound benefit and uh, importance of self-conquest, of bettering oneself and curing oneself of the things that cause us suffering, the bad habits and addictions and aversions and just all the things that hurt us and hurt others, which is what we do in meditation. We change the mind, we tame the mind, so that the mind just sees things objectively without reacting. As the Buddha said, the, the untrained mind is your worst enemy, and the trained mind is your best friend.
That's what this verse is referring to. So quite simple, but powerful, meaningful, and something to remember whenever you feel like you should gloat or feel like you should conquer others, feel like you should fight, feel like it's somehow meaningful to win an argument. You can remember, ah, now I've just actually lost a, a, a more important battle, and that's the battle with myself, because now I've given rise to ego and attachment and so on. So... That's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Wishing you all.